We are live. Good evening. Welcome to our yet another series of walk-in patients in ophthalmology. This popular series deals with patients in real-life clinical situations who come to your OPD and you don't know what to do, do uh, with them. Specifically, so with neuro-ophthalmology, which most of the general ophthalmologists consider as very complex and sometimes very difficult patients to handle. We have this webinar uh, today uh, through AIOS. Dr. Harvan Slal is the president of All India Ophthalmological Society. Most of the work would be done by Rashmin Gandhi, who is a consummate neuro-ophthalmologist, a reputed one, who uh, is affiliated to Center for Sight uh, Hyderabad. Along with him would be the expert panel, Dr. Jawaharlal Goel, Professor Jawaharlal Goel, who is the professor and head of the Department of Ophthalmology, School of Medical Sciences and Research, Shahda University, Noida. Dr. Mahesh Kumar, who is the Chief of Neuro-Ophthalmology Services, Arvind Eye Hospital, Madurai. Dr. Virendra Sachdeva, who is the Consultant Pediatric Ophthalmology, Strabismus and Neuro-Ophthalmology, LB Prasad Eye Institute, Vishakhapatnam. And Dr. Swati Puljale, who is Associate Professor of Ophthalmology, with a specific interest in neuro-ophthalmology from RP Center, AIMS, New Delhi. Our speakers are eminent. Dr. Himali, Himalini Savan, Samant opens uh, uh, the presentations. She's a neuro-ophthalmologist, uh, honorary consultant at Just Lok Hospital and Research Center, Mumbai. She will speak on headache, a patient coming to you with headache. She'll be followed by Dr. Jyoti Matalia, who is head of pediatric ophthalmology, Stabis MS and neuro-ophthalmology from Narayan Netralaya 2, Bangalore, and she'll be speaking on abnormal pupil. Ramesh Kekunaya, who is the director of Child Eye Institute and Technology and Innovation, LV Prasad Eye Institute, Hyderabad, speaks on sudden onset ptosis and diplopia. Dr. Digvijay Singh, director and lead surgeon, Noble Eye Care, Gurgaon, speaks on optic disc edema. And that will be followed by Dr. S. Ambika, who is the director of neuro-ophthalmology, Shankaranitralaya, Chennai, who will speak on the pale optic disc. And finally, the most difficult of the problems, non-glaucomatous visual, visual field effects, how to approach these uh, entities by Dr. Naveen Jayakumar, Senior Consultant, Darshan Eye Care, Chennai. I hand you over to Rashmin Gandhi for, for the proceedings. Uh, thank you, Dr. Santosh. And we would like to thank uh, AIOS for this initiative, uh, which is much needed. And as Dr. Santosh mentioned, a lot of these cases which come to us in our day-to-day -day OPD, uh, uh, in our busy OPD, sometimes we end up missing some of the relevant points. And the whole purpose of this webinar is to highlight those points, uh, taking uh, each case as an example. Uh, I hand over to Dr. Himalini Savant uh, for her talk on headache. Hi, good evening, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity. Can everyone see my sli uh, slides? Yes. Okay. So I'll... Okay. okay. So when you sit in a general ophthalmology OPD, um, every second patient that walks in has complaints of headache. But is every headache clinically significant? And if you search for causes of headache, Dr. Google will give you an endless list. So which headache requires more attention? Which one is non-specific? Which requires neuroimaging and further testing? So these are some of the questions which I hope to answer with this presentation. So let's get familiar with these terms, primary headache and secondary headache. So primary headache are those headaches that don't have a structural cause, for example, a migraine, whereas a secondary headache is that which is caused by a disease, for example, papilledema, brain tumor, optic neuritis, or even a hemorrhage. So how do you do a workup with any patient who comes with headache? So vision is an integral part of any ophthalmology examination, goes without saying. You do a good refraction, and more importantly, a good cycloplegic refraction is required using drugs like cyclopentolate or homide. Pupil examination, again, is mandatory for any examination with or without headache, but presence of an RAPD will tell me that the headache is definitely neurological. If the pupils are abnormal, check for color vision. Do a cover test for near and distance. Measure the NPC, EOMs. So in short, do a good, quick orthoptic evaluation. Fundus, again, is mandatory for any patient who walks in with a headache. You want to rule out any kind of optic disc anomaly. Perimetry, again, forms an integral part of any neuro-ophthalmology case and perform if you're suspecting any neuro-ophthalmology cause. 
So some of the red flags and headache where you will get neuroimaging done is if you have a patient who has a headache and has double vision, loss of vision, or an optic nerve head swelling or disc edema or disc hyperemia, you will definitely neuroimage these patients. Some of the common causes of headache in our OPD is press biopia, commonest cause in a 40-year-old population. Any refractive error. Now, amongst all the three refractive er errors, a headache is more commonly seen in patients who have undiagnosed astigmatism and hyperopia. Patients who have conversions or insufficiency, not very uncommonly seen in our OPD. Those who have intermittent divergent squints or exophorias, accommodative esotropia or esophorias, and of course, migraine. So I'm going to talk a little bit about migraine. So it's a primary headache. The women are commonly affect, more commonly affected as compared to men. And it may be associated with nausea, vomiting, sometimes blurring of vision, which is typically described as a cloud which is moving in front of the eyes and photophobia. Remember, migraine is a diagnosis of exclusion and usually neuroimaging is not required. It responds well to medication. But those cases of migraine where suddenly there is an increase in the frequency or the intensity of the headache, in those patients who complain that the aura lasts for more than an hour or any migraine that is associated with other neurological symptoms such as imbalance or difficulty in speech, you will definitely neuroimage. So let's begin with the first case, a 55-year-old lady. She came into the OPD and she said, doctor, I have this right-sided pain and this right-sided headache. The vision was six by six, the pupils were reacting, the fundus was normal. So I simply reassured the patient, gave some placebo drops and some painkillers and told her that all, all is going to be well, the pain is non-specific. But a few days later, she returned back to my OPD and this time, along with the right-sided pain, there was decreased vision. The vision from six by six in the right eye had dropped to six by 36, but the left eye was normal. There was a clear RAPD in the right eye with absent color vision and the right eye disc looked hyperemic as compared to the left eye. So the positive findings now were painful, sudden loss of vision, along with headache, with loss of color vision, suspect optic neuritis, and this requires neuroimaging with contrast. So that's what we did. And this was the MRI picture, which shows marked enhancement of the optic nerve. So this patient was obviously treated with IVMP followed by an oral taper. She was investigated and found to be more positive. But the reason I'm showing this case to you is to take home two messages. Number one, one-sided headache may precede vision loss and optic neuritis. And second, whenever you are reassuring a patient with headache, always counsel that if the headache of, uh, if the intensity of the headache increases or doesn't get better in a few days or is associated with other neurological symptoms, then he must report back. And in that case, a neuroimaging is mandatory. The next case is that of a 25-year-old, and she again came with complaints of little blurring of vision. She had complaints of severe headache, which was not responding to a painkiller. Her ocular examination was normal with vision 6-9, but improved to 6-6 with refraction. The pupils were not checked because by the time the patient came to me, she was already dilated. But the fundus revealed this. So again, the take-home message is that if a fundus examination is mandatory for any patient who comes with complaints of headache, even though you may think that the headache is nonspecific. If you do not have time to dilate the patient, it, a patient with complaints of headache definitely merits even an undilated fundus examination. The third case is that of a 15-year-old girl, and she complained of headaches more towards the end of the day. Sometimes she complained of blurring, especially at the end of the day, particularly while looking at distance. The vision was six by six in both the eyes. The fundus was normal. The color vision, the pupils were brisk. But this is what happened when I saw her. So the eyes looked straight when I saw her, but if one were to break the fusion, then you clearly see that she has a large exophoria and she's able to fuse quickly. So what she had was an intermittent divergent squint. So patients with IDS can control the squint, but towards the end of the day, some amount of muscle fatigue sets in and they're no longer able to fuse. At that point, they may even complain of momentary double vision. There's a constant effort to keep the eyes aligned and that's what causes the headache. So how can we help this patient? If the angle of squint is small, then we try convergence exercises. But if the control deteriorates and the angle increases, then the only option is squint surgery. Needless to say that in these cases, there's no role of neuroimaging. So now I'm going to share with you this video. 
को मैम मेरा लड़का है विहान कस्तूरी इसका है ना दस साल का ही है अभी इसका सर दर्द हो रहा है तो सर दर्द के लिए क्या किया आपने पहले तो मैंने सिटी स्कैन करवाया वो नॉर्मल आ रहा है और फिर बाद में ओपनी नंबर ट्वेंटी सिक्स मैम ने बोला है कि पहले आई चेकअप करवा लो मैम क्या बोलती है फिर यहाँ पे आके बता दो ओके सो दिस पेशेंट ठीक है आप so this patient first goes to the neuro opd because there is complaint of headache in the neuro opd without any eye examination they straight away get a ct scan done obviously the ct scan is normal and so the patient is asked to now go and do the eye check up i feel the reverse should have been done now this if you take a look at this video again the child has a large exophoria and so again this is a case of an intermittent divergent squint which was wrongly neuroimaged the next case is that of a 4 year old child and she complained of occasional squinting and he headache which was more after returning from school the vision was 6 by 6 and the fundus was normal so on cover test we found that the patient had an intermittent convergent squint more while staring at anything near the undilated refraction was about 1 plus 1.5 in both the eyes but when we did a cycloplegic refraction using atropin uh, sorry in this case we used cyclopentylate we found that the refractive error was almost plus 6 so this is the video of the patient the child's eyes are absolutely straight but when she tries to look at anything near intermittently the eyes would go inside so why the headache in accommodative esotropia the child wants to see clearly the near objects but because the vision is a bit blurred and because of the latent hypermetropia they tend to accommodate now when the accommodative effort is lot then with every unit of accommodation there is a unit of convergence and hence the quick convergence squint the headache is because of the accommodative accommodative effort which is required to see clearly but once the glasses are given the accommodative effort becomes zero and hence no convergence and no squint what is the treatment so one first of all needs to explain to the parents and counsel them about the high plus refractive error it is very difficult to convince the parents that their child has a plus 6 refractive error because most of the times the parents are tell you will tell you that doctor we only come to you with squint which is occasional but most of the times the vision is normal so you, it is up to you, us to explain to them that the glasses are being given not really for the vision but to correct the squint and thereby correcting the headache the importance here is to give the full cycloplegic refraction to correct the squint the next case is similar to the previous case so this patient also complained about uh, squinting which was sudden onset but every time the child would squint the parents would say that there would be a right sided headache the eyes would become straight after a few hours when the headache would subside so this was a picture taken when the child came in to the opd with squinting and an hour later when her headache subsided the eyes were absolutely straight on looking at the extraocular movements the movements were full and the fundus was normal now as compared to the previous patient where she had a similar presentation but the cycloplegic refraction showed a plus 6 refractive error in this patient the cyclo cycloplegic retinoscopy showed no refractive error so what she had was an acute intermittent concomitant esotropia why concomitant because the eoms were completely normal so when i see this kind of a picture my first differential was could she be having a myasthenia so we did an entire myasthenia workup and she was found to be normal because the myasthenia workup and other relevant tests were normal we decided to neuroimage and when we neuroimaged with contrast we saw enhancement of the sixth nerve so this suggested that probably the patient was having an ophthalmoplegic migraine so when you have a squint plus headache with all other tests negative think about ophthalmoplegic migraine in your differential diagnosis this patient was treated with steroids and later put on to calcium channel blockers to prevent the recurrence of the migraine the next case is that of a 24 year old college student who complained of headache and uh, asking a, a little detailed history the, the this person spent at least 8 hours on gadgets uh, so different gadgets like laptops mobile phones looking at social media had late nights headaches were more towards the evening uh, towards the end of the day and relieved on sleeping so this is a patient who had convergence insufficiency so if you take a look at this picture video i'm i'm asking him to look at my finger and i'm bringing the finger close to the nose and you see that the left eye is drifting out a little bit and then again on coaxing he's able to bring it back so the take home message here is that 
This case stresses the importance of doing a quick orthoptic evaluation. All patients with complaints of headache ask for history of occupation, how much time do they spend on gadgets, etc. And normally convergence insufficiency is seen in tailors, in diamond sorters, in accountants, in stockbrokers who are constantly looking at computers. So occupational history is again an important question in a patient who complains of headache. Treatment of convergence insufficiency, obviously limit the use of gadgets, take frequent breaks, try and follow the 2020 rule. And amongst all the gadgets, explain to the mother or to the adult that the TV is the least damaging because it's at, at a distance followed by the laptop, followed by the iPad and the mobile phone. Glasses are given usually at convergence exercises. And if there are no help uh, with simple glasses, then you could incorporate small amount of prisms. But a word of caution is that they often present with pseudomyopia and hence, again, in these patients, a cycloplegic refraction is a must. So therefore, to summarize, every headache requires evaluation, uh, a careful and a meticulous uh, examination should be done. Neuroimaging should be limited to a select few cases and not randomly done for all patients who walk in. And even if the headache is nonspecific, don't forget to check even the undilated fundus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hema. May I request uh, Dr. Virinder to lead the discussion, please? Uh, thanks, Dr. Rashmin. And uh, thanks, AIS, for involving all of us in this interactive webinar. Okay. Wonderful talk, Dr. Hema. Uh, you very well covered the red flag signs that make anybody suspect that there is a neurological cause, as well as you highlighted other common scenarios that we come across. Uh, I think apart. I can't hear anyone, huh? Dr. Virendra, I can't hear you. Okay, no, I'm... I think it's, it's quite clear. Maybe your computer. One. Yeah, go ahead. Really? Okay. Uh, I hope I am audible. And... Yes. Yes, you are. Okay, thank you. So I think one more important, a few more important things that we should keep in mind is that a person might be having a prior history of headaches. But a recent change in character of headaches could signify a super added pathology, like a person has primary headache disorders, but at the same time, headache is becoming more constant. It is associated with blurring of vision, with change in posture, any associated double vision or uh, tinnitus could signify that something else is happening in the brain. There could be increased pressure. And uh, as you highlighted the case of the 55-year-old uh, person with acute onset headache and blurring of vision, at that age, we should also keep in mind that a person could be having an arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy that could also be uh, causing a potential damage both to the vision as well as systematically. So these would be certain important things that should also be kept in mind in our broad differential diagnosis. But you very well summarized that we have to do a thorough examination from anterior to posterior and uh, including the refraction, the history of screen time. All those are very important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Virinder. Any other comments, quick comments? One thing I want to emphasize is that we must ask the history of uh, uh, the headache, whether it is more in the morning, or noon, evening, or night. Actually, if uh, the headache is more in the morning, that means the patient might be having a papillary month. If the patient is having a headache uh, morning time, it's all right. But at the noon time or afternoon, it becomes worse. Then you must suspect a sinus headache. Then uh, you also see if uh, the giant cell arthritis as was mentioned. So that headache is usually there in the evening and uh, it is more problematic while combing the hairs. And uh, lastly, if your headache uh, wakes you up in the night, then it is a cluster headache. So all these uh, headaches, they fall in the purview of ophthalmologist only. So we must uh, keep these things in mind. And then we must ask whether the headache is episodic or continuous. A continuous headache is usually tension headache. And that too, if it is uh, lasting for more than 15 days, then it becomes chronic and must be uh, neurologically tested by imaging and uh, episodic headache uh, otherwise uh, migraine also is an episodic headache and cluster headache also is an episodic headache. So once the patient says that he is having headache 
so we must ask whether it is a unilateral bilateral unilateral is always ocular and bilateral is usually uh, neurological headache and then uh, whether it is episodic or it is continuous then we should ask at what time it is the maximum whether in the morning noon afternoon or so so these th these things uh, we must be uh, asking these patients and then we must ask whether the headache is how it is relieved or it is aggravated if it is relieved by sleep uh, just lying down that means maybe the patient has undergone csf uh, uh, test then the, it will be relieved by lying down and if it is increasing by coughing etc then uh, we must suspect a cluster headache or some vascular headache which will increase on uh, coughing or straining or standing down standing also thank you thank, thank you those are very uh, very pertinent comments thank you dr goel uh, let's move on. We move on to our second talk of the evening, and may I invite Dr. Ambika to talk on approach to a patient with pale disc. Thank you, organizers, for having us here. Well, is my screen visible? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk on how to triage a pale disc. Well, we all in our clinical practice would have come across such shades of disc pallor, starting from a temporal pallor to a primary to a secondary optic atrophy, a consecutive or a glaucomatous optic atrophy. And for those who could not spot this, this is a bauti pallor. And these types of pale disc, all of them do have a cause behind. So most of the time, these sort of pale disc, it's not that all pale disc are non-treatable. There are so many optic neuropathies behind these pale discs, which if we properly evaluate and do a stepwise approach in finding the cause, we can pin down the etiology behind them and also treat these causes. Many a times we may have patients who have accidentally realized that they don't have a vision, particularly when there is a monocular optic neuropathy. Those are the ones who end up having as a pale disc as a presenting feature. And if you see this, definitely this is not a normal optic nerve head coming over here. And this is pale. So if you see something like this, you have to start evaluating that there is something behind that vision loss. And if you start getting the history, few of them may have these associated symptoms like a sudden drop in vision in the past, which may or may not be associated with a TVOs. And the nature of the vision loss can help you in pinning down the cause. If you see a pale disc and a patient coming with a gradual progressive drop in vision, it could be a compressive optic neuropathy. If it is a drop in vision, which to certain extent improves spontaneously by two to three weeks down, it could be a inflammatory optic neuropathy like an optic neuritis. Or if it is a drop in vision associated with a gradual or to certain extent of recovery, it could be an ischemic cause behind. So all these optic neuropathies do require a detailed history taking, followed by a comprehensive ophthalmic evaluation, starting from a best corrected visual acuity to color vision, pupillary examination, anterior and posterior segment fundus evaluation, and an electrophysiological test should be used as and when required. But OCT will definitely give a clue regarding the structural changes when we see a OCT, uh, when we see a pale disc. And uh, visual fields, AMSLERS, ultrasound, angiograph all have their own clues, but nothing like a relative afferent pupillary defect in a monocular optic neuropathy. So remember that you could see a relative afferent defect only when there is a monocular optic pathway dysfunction. And when there is a bilateral disc pallor, you could sometimes see a bilateral sluggishly reacting pupil when the lesion is before the LGB. And visual fields will give us the key for the type of optic neuropathies what we come across. So if you end up seeing a central or a centrocecal field loss, most of the times a cause is a hereditary or a toxic. If it is a central, altitudinal or a constricted, any form, optic neuritis can be behind that. Particularly after this atypical forms of optic neuritis, you can get any type of optic nerve, uh, optic neuritis producing visual field loss. 
And if it's going to be ischemic optic neuropathy, most of the times it could be altitudinal and non-arthritic, and sometimes it can be a constricted field. And vertical meridian respecting visual fields like hemianopias are invariably associated with intracranial pathology. And most commonly, if it's a gradual drop in vision, pale disc, and you end up seeing an intracranial space occupying lesion. It could be a homonymous or a heteronymous visual field loss, and particularly the hemianopias, please do remember to ask for a imaging. And peripheral field loss is not that commonly seen in neuroophthalmic disorders because more than 70% of the visual field defects in neuroophthalmology do observe in the central 30 degrees. And if you come across a peripheral field, you have to remember that optic perineuritis is one condition where a patient can have a subacute vision loss and can have a very peripheral visual field loss. And apart from that, you can have a malingerous or a cancer-associated retinopathy or a paraneoplastic optic neuropathies. As I mentioned, these uh, this is the macular cube and the optic nerve cube. Sometimes if you see a pale disc with a severe ganglion cell layer, you can also prognosticate this patient about the recovery pattern of the disc pallor, what you would end up seeing because ganglion cell layer happens much ahead before you see the retinal nerve fiber layer loss in an OCT. So let me go across with few case-based uh, explanations. This is a 37-year-old female who had a gradual drop in vision seven years back. And she says that she had a very poor response with IVMP because locally she was diagnosed as optic neuritis. When she presented to us, she had a vision of counting fingers closed face and that of the left eye was normal with normal color vision. An MRI brain done elsewhere had a diffuse optic nerve thickening and it was reported as optic neuritis. But since the cuts were inadequate, we went ahead and repeated the imaging. And if you could see here, there is a diffuse thickening of the optic nerve in this axial T1 MR and that of this post-contrast uh, fast suppress technique, you could see a brilliant enhancement of this diffuse optic nerve thickening. So this is not a optic neuritis and I'm seeing her almost more than seven years after the vision loss with a pale disc and this is not optic neuritis and nothing but an optic nerve sheath meningioma which got misdiagnosed in the early phases as neuritis. Following a 26 fractions of IMRT, the patient by seven to eight months she recovered to 624 vision and that of the left eye remained normal. And in fact, she was able to perform a visual field when she came for the follow-up after the radiation therapy. So it is an optic nerve sheath meningioma, which had the disc pallor on presentation. So this is a case too of an 18-year-old male who was uh, actually, he visited us in 2017, who's a known case of uh, adamantinomous uh, craniopharyngioma. And he was operated, he had a terional craniotomy with a near total removal excision of the mass lesion in 2015. And post-surgery, he had an MRI which had a residual mass and also some calcifications for which he was also subsequently treated with radiotherapy. He had a cyber knife modality of management. So when we saw him first time, he had a 6'6 vision and this was his uh, optic disc appearance, what you could see. There were temporal pallor in both eyes, but fairly very good visual fields apart from few paracentral and temporal defects in both the eyes. And the OCT had a gross ganglion cell loss and a relative loss in the retinal nerve fiber. So this was his pre-surgery. You could see the huge mass, which has caused his vision loss in 2015. And this is his post-treatment. You could see that specs of calcification in this residual tumor. But suddenly he came back to us in 2022 with a subacute vision loss with a diplopia. At that time, he had a vision of 618 and 69 in both eyes. Apart from the vision loss, he also had features of a pupil involving right third nerve palsy and he had a bilateral inferior dense temporal defects. And if you could see here, there was a cystic expansion of the mass what he had and there was a cystic recurrent craniopharyngioma what he developed in 2022. So by that time, he again had a re-exploration and excision of the mass and this was his optic disc when he was seen at that time. You could see the amount of uh, optic disc pallor in spite of which his vision dramatically improved after the re-surgery of the mass lesion. There was a recovery of the double vision 
and even the visual fields also recovered and he was advised for a four months follow-up. So in a compressive optic neuropathy, all you would end up seeing is a pale disc down the line, but or do perform a proper visual field and all optic nerve function assessment to, to actually to find out what type of response you're getting for the treatment. And this is a third case who was presented to us, a 44-year-old female with complaints of gradual onset progressive drop in vision over two months. When I saw it was a very subtle temporal pallor with a physiological cupping, what I could see there, she had a three by 60 vision in both eyes and a dropped color vision. And both the eyes were sluggishly having a reaction to the uh, light reaction to the of the pupil. And anterior segment fundus eval anterior segment evaluation was normal. And this was the fundus evaluation. So if you could see the peel loss, it was a dense paracentral, which is more in the temporal quadrant. And then she gives the history of taking an antitubercular treatment with an ethambutol, which she has stopped some few months back. And so what we saw here was a toxic optic neuropathy due to ethambutol. After stopping ethambutol and when she was put on supplements, by three months, she had a good recovery of the visual fields as well as the vision and the color vision recovery. And this was the visual field with very subtle temporal defects, but much better than her earlier visual fields. So this is a optic disc uh, involvement following a toxic optic neuropathy secondary to ethambutol. And this is a 47-year-old female, again had a gradual drop in vision over two years. She was diagnosed elsewhere as an open ankle glaucoma and she was on anti-glaucoma medication. She was a known hypertensive for a chronic duration. When I saw it was uh, almost near normal vision in the right eye and the left eye had a 6-12 vision with a relative afferent defect. And this is the gross fundus evaluation, uh, what you could see, the disc, very subtle pallor in the right eye, but otherwise the fundus is normal. And that of the left eye showed a pale disc with a relatively narrowed vessels. And when you could see this visual fields, this is not something to match with the pale disc, what I saw, or rather the fundus. So there is a grossly constricted visual fields in both eyes, having only a central island. So how do we proceed now? So we did an ERG, which showed a normal rod and cone, and MRI brain showed a gross thinning of the left optic nerve. But we went ahead being a young patient. We went all the atypical optic neuropathy workup, and then we figured out that she had a raised ESR and a uh, CRP. She had a hemoglobin, which has dropped. Her other autoimmune workups were negative. And on our physician on evaluation, he mentioned that there's an interarm difference and a thrill in the right supraclavicular region. So the mammogram was negative. The echo showed a concentric left ventricular hypertrophy, probably because of her hypertension. And she had a cardiomegaly and a right chronic pyelonephritis. So provisionally, we made a diagnosis of Takayasu's arthritis associated with an optic neuropathy secondary to ischemia. And uh, a rheumatologist went ahead, did a CT angio, chest and abdomen, along with a cardiac opinion, where we found out that she had a iotoarthritis with critical stenosis of left common carotid artery, which could explain her uh, uh, significant changes in the left eye. But she had in both the eyes a significant visual field loss due to a vascular insufficiency. And that could be the reason for her left, uh, left eye visual loss. So this is a 74-year-old male who came with sudden progressive drop in vision, which is not, uh, um, I mean, uh, post-cataract surgery, he had relatively better vision, which has dropped fast in this last five months. But when we examined, he had a 6-6 vision and a good color vision and a good pseudophakia. Again, there was only very mild temporal pallor and there were few mild RP alterations in the mid-periphery and the, otherwise the fundus was grossly normal. And the visual field, it's a constricted field with a central island. So is this an optic neuropathy? What do you proceed next with? So we went ahead with electroretinogram and we found that it was a non-recordable single flash rod as well as uh, cone responses were grossly reduced both in photopic and scotopic changes. And MRI brain and orbit was normal. VEP showed a normal latency, but a amplitude reduction. So this could be a cancer associated retinopathy because this diagnosis we made retrospectively because when we started evaluating him for all the other uh, systemic uh, examination, 
we found that on CT chest, we picked up a CA lung. It was a, on a post-surgery, we found that it was an Otsil carcinoma and uh, anti-recoverin reports we were not able to get subsequently. The vision was also progressively dropping and in fact, we lost the patient in a short interval. So to conclude, uh, detailed history taking is very vital when you see a pale disc and not all pale discs are end of the road. So a comprehensive ocular examination is a must. Optic neuropathy due to uh, eye vision loss can be sometimes disproportionate to the amount of the optic nerve appearance. And maculopathy can be having uh, associated vision loss sometimes. Rule out for history of metamorphopsias, evaluate the rod cone dysfunctions, and see for any photopsias associated with the vision loss. Amsolate testing is a simple home tool when you see patients with central visual field defects to monitor the macular versus an optic nerve causes. Electrophysiological tests, neuroimaging, visual fields, all of them have a vital role in evaluating the cause. And please do use them wisely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ambiga, for the excellent coverage of your uh, uh, varieties of uh, optic neuropathies of pale disc and the etiologies. Uh, Dr. Ambiga has wonderfully uh, covered the most important aspects of uh, pale disc, that is the history, which is most important. We need to ask the onset and the progression of the optic, uh, optic atrophy to know the possible cause. Uh, we should remember that optic atrophy is not the end result as she rightly point, pointed out. It is It just represents one end point which we should uh, use to find out the cause. And all, and all optic atrophies does not mean the vision is lost forever. We have scope for uh, subsequent recovery. Uh, I have one question for Dr. Ambika. Uh, do you observe uh, optic partial optic atrophies in case of a macular problem due to a papillomacular bundle uh, defects? So the question is, do you see optic neuropathies or temporal pallor when yes. we have macular uh, uh, diseases? Yes, see, many right. times, many times we do have central visual field defects where we have uh, unexplained vision loss. Because when you see a central field defect and a macular pathology, we would like to rule out whether is it uh, in the onset wise. For example, if the patient had a fever, it could be a post neuritic type of central scotoma or a macular related, because in fact, we had a patient where we had macular changes along with the temporal pallor. In these conditions, when a patient is not able to differentiate the onset, when there is a no past history of a, uh, of a vision loss or a central scotoma, then you may have to prude more in terms of drug intake. In fact, that patient had a chloroquine intake because he was treated for a chronically for an arthritis where he had a repeated attacks of fever and one of the fevers was misconstrued as a post-fever optic neuritis. But when we see a central field loss, if you could not differentiate, multifocal ERG can have an added value, pattern ERG, MF ERG, in addition to the entire optic nerve function test will help us differentiate a macular cause versus a uh, optic neuropathy. And most of the times, these optic neuropathies due to all these um, subacute viral illnesses do settle down. But what I have observed is the macular related field loss do remain for a chronic period and they just generally don't fade that easily as a post neuritic central defects. We do see. So I think it, it depends upon the etiology. Mesh, if your question was that, would you find uh, optic atrophy or a pale disc or a temporal pallor in patients who have a mac predominantly macular pathology? I think the answer would be what, as Ambika said, what causes the macular pathology? And there are, there are causes which will lead to both macular and optic nerve involvement. But if it's just a, a macular pathology like a diabetic uh, macular edema, you are less likely to see disc, disc pallor, which is related to a macular cause. Yes. Thank you. I want to add some points. <clears throat> One is that in any case of pale disc, you have done, you have uh, demonstrated in optic, uh, uh, in intracranial space occupying lesions where the optic nerve is compressed, the compressive optic neuropathy. Now, one of the uh, feature, prognostic feature in compressive optic neuropathy is you do 
OCT. If the OCT is less than 75 micron, it shows seven, less than 75 micron RNF layer thickness. Then that means this patient might, might not improve postoperatively after removing the space occupying lesion. So that is uh, one of the criteria for uh, giving the prognosis to these patients of compressive optic neuropathy. Secondly, for postgraduates, I want to emphasize that ganglion cell loss first will lead to loss in the retinal nerve fiber layer, which will show rake effects on the retinal nerve fiber layer. That means dark bands in the uh, brilliantly uh, brilliant retinal nerve fiber layers. So that these are the rake effects. That means the the ganglion cell uh, retinal nerve fiber layer they are lost in that area. And uh, optic nerve pillar appears four to six weeks after the onset of uh, ganglion cell damage. So majority of the times in compressive optic neuropathy, even in toxic optic neuropathy, we see the normal disc. So that does not mean that the insult has not occurred. And uh, lastly, the, we, if there is a vision loss and the fundus is normal, the VEP is the only criteria. VEP will give you the instantaneous diagnosis because this OCT changes both in the uh, retinal nerve fiber layer thickness or ganglion cell thickness. That will appear one month or three months later. But VEP will give you instantaneous uh, uh, response that uh, the vision is lost because of the optic nerve pathology or ganglion cell pathology. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you for those uh, pearls of wisdom. Uh, let's move on and we'll, we'll go to our third talk of the evening. Thank you, Dr. Ambika. That was a wonderful, lovely cases. Uh, now I invite Dr. Jyoti for her talk on pupils. Thanks, Dr. Rashmin. You are able to see my slides? Yes, beautiful. <laughs> yes, thank you. So I'm going to be talking about deciphering the pupil and I want to thank Dr. Rashmin and Dr. Santosh for this opportunity. Pupil are very important uh, tests that we need to do because it helps us reach to multiple conditions and figure out a lot of problems. So to start with, let's start with this case of 45 year old male who came with a significant NIDDM, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia with a painful loss of vision in the right eye the vision as less as finger counting one meter. And you can see that there are significant ischemic factors which are there, which cause the loss of vision. Now, when you have a condition like this, yes, it's apparent, this pupil evaluation anyway, my talk is on that. But prior to that, let me take you into the importance of what pupil evaluation is all about. So let's start with first the importance of pupil evaluation. As we are aware, it's a round, pupil is round, equal, regular, light responsive and accommodation responsive, equal in both eyes, so we have to know and an important sign not only for ophthalmology, but also for neurology. Let's understand the anatomy because before we, unless we know that it's difficult to figure out how to go about. So here it is basically the sphincter muscles which are around the pupil controlled by the parasympathetic fibers and the dilator, which are the sympathetic fibers radially oriented. That is a dilator muscle along the length of the uh, iris, right? And we also have to be aware of the pathways, the pupillary right reflex direct that is illuminated reflects when you shine the light in the eye directly how the pupil reacts and the consensual the same effect which is seen in the other eye the dark reflex is when you switch off the light what happens to the pupil when it slightly dilates and then your reflex important because it has a different site of origin and hence you can have the concept of light near dissociation so let's understand the pupillary light pathway we know that the as you shine light it is carried by the optic uh, nerve and the optic tract uh, it basically decussets at the optic chiasma, that is the first level of decussession, and then at the edingo-vespal's nucleus, that is in the midbrain, where then the fibers are carried by the third nerve through the ciliary ganglion to the pupil to cause the pu constriction. That is one. And the important other part, the dark reflex, which is the initial contracture, contraction of the dilator muscle followed by sphincter inhibition from the hypothalamus, as you can see here, to the dilator pupillae. So basically, this is the dilator pathway and the and I'll let you know why this is important. So once we know the anatomy, let's understand how we should be doing the pupillary evaluation. The few requisites are room lighting conditions. We have to keep mesopic conditions, distant target fixation because we don't want accommodation to set in and cause a constriction and no tactile stimulus. 
So this is how you do. You compare the size of the pupil uh, in each eye, measure it and compare with the other eye. And you can either use the pupil gorge or the pen light. And this is an important test that you do in addition to the light reflex, where you study the pupillary reflex on shining light in each eye, also do a swinging light reflex. A rapid shift between the two eyes, a multiple alternations, allowing three to five seconds on each eye to allow stabilization. And you have to rule out hip piss, which is commonly seen in young patients. And the interpretation is that if you have a defective pathway, it could be an afferent pathway where the patient will have a RAPD, which is also called as relative afferent pupillary defect. The efferent pathway, which starts from the midbrain via the third nerve, that is the anisocoria, right? So now let's look at uh, each of them separately. So coming back to our case, this is the patient whom we have. Now we are looking at the pupillary examination. Please note that the pupil in both eyes, as you're looking at the left eye and you're shining light from the left eye to the right eye, you'll see the pupil in the light eye tends to dilate. But when you go to the left eye, there's a constriction. In the right eye, it appears to dilate. That's because the pupillar motor reflex is not sufficient in the right eye to maintain a constriction and the pupil in the right eye appears to dilate. So what we actually have now is an RAPD in the right eye relative to the other eye. So again, to just make and the uh, postgraduates to know, as you're switching from the left eye, which is a swinging flashlight test, from the left eye to the right eye, the pupillary dilatation is seen to happen, but in the left eye, there's a significant constriction. So this is a right eye RAPD. Now, when you have an RAPD, we know it's basically an optic nerve disease because of the impaired function, since we know that the fibers of the pupillary light reflex are carried via the optic nerve. And those patients, also called as Marcus Gunn pupil, will definitely have a right eye optic neuropathy. So then going back and doing a fundus examination, we noted that this patient actually had a, a sectoral pallor with a disc edema seen in and had an anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. As already mentioned, had significant ischemic risk factors. The patient got treated. The other eye had a disc risk and also had to be treated so that he does not get an attack in the other eye. Now, case two was a 20-year-old girl, a student from Bangalore presented with pain in the left upper eyelid, pain on eye movements, and a decreased vision in that eye with no other significant history or any complaints in the past. Yes, we know that when you have a situation like this, other than the vision, you also do the color vision and contrast, which was abnormal in the left eye. So then coming back to a pupil, just as a reinforcement, see when you're shining light from the right eye to the left eye in the swinging flashlight test, you notice that the left eye pupil appears to dilate. So it is apparent from what I just showed, that's a left eye RAPD. So this patient having a left eye RAPD, we know now it's an optic neuropathy. So go and look at the fundus examination and you'll notice that the left eye, there is a significant blurring of the nerve fiber layer all around with the fullness of the cup, indicating that the patient has a left eye disc edema confirmed as an inferior altitudinal scotoma in the left eye. This patient was eventually diagnosed to have optic neuritis underwent MRI scanning to rule out multiple sclerosis, right? So now what happens if you have a normal disc with RAPD? You know that when there's RAPD, it is definitely optic neuropathy. So look at other causes, lateral neuritis, for which you have to rule out all the demyelinating causes, needing therefore uh, MRI, a posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, look at other causes and traumatic, ask a proper history. Now there are certain conditions that we have to rule out and challenging questions related to RAPD. Most important question asked by so many postgraduates, is there a bilateral RAPD? No, that does not exist. What is RAPD? It's a relative afferent pupillary defect relative to the other eye. So the patient does not have and has an RAPD, which is gone. Either the optic neuropathy has resolved, which usually happens after eight weeks, or the other eye is now involved. So relook, do it and see if there's a bilateral optic nerve involvement, in which case you will have bilateral sluggishly reacting pupils. The next important question is, is there anisocoria in RAPD? Can the pupil be small in RAPD? Again, no, that does not happen. In RAPD, the pupil size is always normal because the other eye being normal, the pupillary constriction is as good when you shine the light in the other eye. So there is never an anisocoria unless there's an associated efferent pathway. And finally, if there is one, uh, if there, can you check RAPD with only one working, working pupil? Yes, you can use the working pupil Point to note is that irrespective of the side of the observed pupil, the eye being checked is the eye that the light is stimulus or not. And I will explain this with animation subsequently to show how important that is. Now that we have done this, let's look at the possibility of the efferent defects. Starting with a case, a 30 year to 38 year old gentleman with blurred vision in the left eye. If you can see the distant vision was fine, but the near vision was N12 in the left eye. 
color vision normal, contrast is normal. Pupil shows three millimeters in the right eye reacting to light and this other eye seven millimeters. The anterior segment and fundus was normal. So the only positive finding was a difference in the size of the pupil. So what do you mean by the size of the pupil is different? Anything more than one millimeter, we call it as anisocoria. Note that in anisocoria, we neither see it's the right eye or the left eye. It's basically a difference between the size of the two pupils. So now let's understand how we decipher an anisocoria. I will try to take out the myths, talk about how to differentiate between the physiological and pathological and talk about the pathological. And finally, certain scenarios where what you do if you have an RAPD with an anisocoria. So what we have to understand, and I'm again reiterating that afferent defect never causes anisocoria. It is only a sluggishness, but the size will remain the same. It's the efferent pathway. And what are we talking about efferent pathway? The sympathetic part, which supplies the dilator pupillae and the parasympathetic, that is the constrictor pupillae, which is given in their innervation as is shown. So what we have to understand is the sympathetic pathway causes pupillary dilatation. And because of this problem, there's a poorly dilating pupil and, the, and it remains constricted in the dim light because dilatation happens when the lights are shut off. Whereas in case of parasympathetic, it is a, a pathway which causes pupillary constriction. So any defect will lead to poorly constricting pupil and that remains dilated in bright light. And that is important. How do you differentiate the two, right? So now let's first understand whether the particular anisocoria is actually physiological or not. So let when you have a pupil, we first find out which pupil is affected, whether the smaller pupil or the larger pupil. And secondly, it's physiological or pathological. For that, we have to check the direct and consensual reflex in both the eyes. So as you look at the direct reflex, note for the pupillary constriction, and at the same time, look at the consensual light reflex in the eyes to see if the amount is same or not. And what is the first particular reason to say it's physiological? That the difference in the pupillary size between the two eyes is proportionally maintained while testing the light reflex. That's your first point to say it's physiological. The second is about dilation lag. So let me consider two anisocoria case scenarios, as you can see here. Basically, you look for the dilation lag and your ambient lines are switched off, so it becomes dark. The normal pupil will dilate. But in case one, that is scenario, you see the dilatation happens quickly compared to scenario two, where you're observing for some time and then the eye slowly dilates which takes about a lag of five seconds to 20 seconds. Whereas unlike the scenario one, which happens in less than three seconds, this is a dilation lag, which does not happen in physiological anisocoria because of normal muscles, but tends to happen in a condition called Horner syndrome. So this is one important test that you can do in your OPD to differentiate the two. So this is the second point of physiological anisocoria. Now that we're able to differentiate the two and we confirm that this is a pathological anisocoria, let's see how do we go about it. Now, for pathological anisocoria, we have to check whether the anisocoria is increasing in bright light or increasing in dark light. So going back to our case, since the only difference was anisocoria, let's look at the pupils carefully. Now, if you look at this patient, you will notice that the left eye has a larger pupil and it has poor constriction. So as you're putting light, see, there is no constriction in the left eye, but right eye constricts very well. And this is in direct light. But at the same time, if you're giving him a near target, look at the left eye pupil. The near reflex is almost intact. You see that the near reflex, the pupil constriction is perfectly normal in that eye. So when you have a situation like this, we know that the near reflex being normal and less in the left eye than the light reflex, there is a problem here. So normally the light response, which means the constriction to light is always more than the constriction to near. But in this particular case, which is not normal, the near response constriction is much more than the light response indicating a light near dissociation and this patient, therefore, has an ADS myotonic pupil that is the left eye, as you can see. So in addition to this, the parasympathetic supply policies, where the anisocoria is in bright light, lightning conditions, other than ADS, we see a third nerve, a pharmacologically dilated pupil, sphincter damage, which you can detect on the basis of a slit lamp examination. If IOP is more, look at acute congestive glaucoma, right? So what are the, how do you treat this parasympathetic policy or check? You use a pilocarpine with varying concentration, or if you take low dose and has a dramatic constriction, we confirm an AD's tonic pupil. On the other hand, a 2% constriction happening indicates a third nerve palsy, and if it's 4%, it does not even constrict a dilated pupil. So that's how you differentiate, right? So finally, coming to fourth case four, a 35-year-old female with sudden limitation of eye movements with diplopia, good vision, eye motility, as I will show you, 
but has anisocoria more in light. So again, we know this is related to basically parasympathetic problem, fundus being normal, MRI normal. We'll see this curl. If you see carefully, the eyes down and out, there is no elevation, there is no depression, adduction is minus four, and there is only abduction, indicating that this is third nerve. And what is important here is basically anisocoria, which is an important dangerous sign. Why do I say that? In a dilated down and out in involvement of the third nerve, you will see that the pupillar motor fibers which are compressed, and that can happen only in the presence of a PCA aneurysm, and this needs immediate intervention. Also note that if there is a pupil sparing, you may need to watch this patient more carefully because two to three weeks later, it can still get involved. So keep on watching the pupil. And it's important to note that if there's a true uh, third nerve palsy without pupil involvement, you do MRI as your treatment uh, investigation. But if it is a presence of a pupil involvement, it's MRA. And it's therefore important to differentiate the two so you can order the appropriate investigation to prevent a disaster because a patient, if you don't treat in time, Happy, it can turn to be fatal and can lose his life, right? Now let's look at the other option, anisocoria increasing in dark. This is the last case where the 63-year-old female came with drooping of the right eye. The vision was normal. Eye motility was full, but what we saw was the pupil was three millimeters in the right eye and five millimeters in the left eye. And the anisocoria was more in the dark. Uh, and that was in the right eye. So basically fundus showed normal eye, uh, fundus in both eyes. And we had advised the MRI. So what you should know is there is uh, some amount of ptosis in the side with a smaller pupil. When you have something like this, it's important to look at the various causes of anisocoria and dark lightning conditions. The sympathetic palsy and the commonest that we have to rule out and which is can be a disaster is the Horner syndrome. And for that, you can see this is a congenital Horner. Note the ptosis in the eye and the presence of uh, the Bruckner reflex showing the classical small pupil in this eye. Sometimes in congenital cases, you see a heterochromia, which is absent here. And the classical dilatation lag, which I mentioned, is important to check to differentiate. The various tests are basically cocaine, 10%, which obviously is not available, but it dilates a normal pupil. And apraclonidin, 0.5%, which dilates a Horner pupil, but needs two weeks of onset of the disease because then it develops a super sensitivity. Like this patient in the, uh, the top photograph with the left eye Horner, after you put the apraclonidin, you can see that there is a lift of the uh, eyelid ptosis. So coming back uh, to an important scenario, which I have to talk because many a times we have patients who have either sinica in one eye or fixed dilated good. How do you handle these conditions? For that, let me show you with an initial case, one, where the patient has anisocoria and the eye, same eye along with the RAPD. That means same eye anisocoria and RAPD. So how do you go about the same concepts, swinging flashlight tests. And what I said, irrespective of uh, you need to look at the working pupil, which is in the left eye because the right eye has anisocoria, but you will continue to shine light in the right eye. So as you notice by shifting from right eye to left eye, you'll see the left eye pupil constricts, but when it comes to the right eye, the pupil appears to dilate. So you are still trying to shine light in both the eyes, but you're looking at the left eye. So as you move to the right eye, you can see that there's a dilatation. So it's a right eye anisocoria with a right eye RAPD. And hence you have to look at the optic nerve for the right eye. Similar in this case, a right eye anisocoria with a left eye RAPD, uh, one eye anisocoria and the other eye RAPD. Like for example, this 15 year old girl had vision, uh, decreased vision in the left eye, which was corrected with a refractive error, but it showed an ADS pupil in the right eye showing a positive pilocarpine uh, low dose testing and had presence of six millimeter, uh, right eye had six millimeter pupil, but the left eye had only three millimeters. So what do we do in this patient? So we did a swinging flashlight and note, as you move from the right eye to the left eye, the pupil in fact is dilating to the left eye. Right eye as the shine, light is shown, left eye pupil is constricted, but when you go to the left eye, it appears to dilate. So as you're doing the swinging flashlight, we know that the left eye being dilated and optic neuropathy would be suspected in the left eye. So the left eye RAPD and the right eye anisocoria. So when the fundus was evaluated in this patient, you can notice that it's basically a pallid disc edema and this patient was started was diagnosed with takayasu arteritis and that got treated for a IR2 arteritis. So this is how a normal pupillary examination helped pick out optic neuropathy and other issues just by a mere testing. Hence, uh, I want to summarize that if you have an anisocoria, look for whether it's greater in dark. If so, suspect honors, rule out a simple anisocoria and that can be done by the multiple testing to differentiate into the various levels of preganglionic and postganglionic or or aplaclonary. In dim light, you check for the extracellular 
is normal platelet lamp if that is a ad's pupil uh, on the other hand if it is ad's pupil then do a 0.125% pilocarpin testing but on the other hand if the slit lamp shows ophthalmic causes then you know what the problem is but if the extraocular motility is abnormal then we are expecting a third nerve palsy again to reiterate horner's confirmed and third nerve palsy are two things that you have to look for in a patient with an anisocoria horner's is basically a tosis with a smaller pupil whereas third nerve is a tosis with a larger pupil because you never want a disaster and note that if there's a horner confirmed on the basis of these various characteristics like meiosis tosis and hydrosis and anophthalmos it's usually benign but it can reflect serious disease in the neck or the chest like the patient i showed had a pancos tumor and that's why she presented with a sudden drooping and with the horner and secondly in a carotid artery dissection in a young patient with facial or neck pain following a neck trauma so never forget these two because we would not want the patient to lose his life with this i would like to thank you for the patient listening and i can take any questions Thank you, Jyoti, for that uh, excellent talk. It was a wonderful talk with all those animations and everything well explained. Um, I just want to emphasize, as you rightly said, it's important to do a slit lamp examination in an isochoria cases because most of the time that's what you know many uh, general ophthalmologists or residents may forget to do that. You have to look for those subtle changes in the sphincter, the, um, uh, in the sphincter of the pupil. And also at the pupil margin. So sometimes that may be overlooked, especially if there's a history of trauma. The second point, I was just uh, thinking that if you have a RAPD, I mean, if you have an afferent and an efferent effect in the same eye, just like where you, wherever you have an orbital apex lesions where both, you know, third nerve and the optic nerve will also get involved. So in such cases, how would you like to go about? Maybe uh, you can explain or... Yeah, I just showed as in the... Uh in my animations that basically it's very common to have one eye uh, as a fixed pupil or something and the other eye having RAPD or even in the same eye. Yeah. So as long as we have a working pupil, we need to look at that pupil, but the swinging flashlight has to be done and simultaneously you have to illuminate both the pupils. So by just look, illuminating both the pupils, but keeping in mind, looking at the working pupil, which pupil is being illuminated and comparing the two, we'll be able to detect which eye actually has the RAPD and uh, and accordingly, you can investigate and find out what is the probable cause for the same. Right. So just consensual is the probably yes, is the most right. important thing when you have these kind of cases. Yeah, I mean, just to tell that the consensual, because there's a double deck session happening at the chiasma and then at the uh, midbrain. So basically, just looking at one pupil, because there is the same reflex going to the other, uh, other eye, we are able to actually get the same effect of the fixed eye pupil in that eye. So as we can compare and find out the cause. Right, exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any more questions or, uh, sir, if you have anything else to say? Just I, I wanted to emphasize two points. So one is that this is the objective test by swinging torchlight, as you have mentioned. But there is a subjective um, evaluation also by the patient itself. If you show the torchlight in both the uh, eyes and you ask the patient the brightness brightness of the light in uh, right and left eye and uh, you compare the involved eye with the with the, the normal eye so he will be able to tell you how many percent of uh, brightness is visualized by the abnormal eye as compared to the normal eye secondly even in uh, cases of uh, this rapd patients they have color problems also so if you show the uh, uh, if, if you show the bottle caps, red bottle caps, and uh, you ask them to compare between the two eyes, so the involved eye will be showing you, uh, they will tell you that the involved eye brightness is much lesser as compared to the uh, normal eye. And one more uh, um, emphasizing point is that in case of uh, AD's pupil, I have all. Uh, Earlier also mentioned that in AD's pupil, they must keep a card because if that AD's pupil person falls in uh, somewhere and roadside accident or head injury and he is brought to the hospital and uh, seeing the anisocoria, the neurosurgeon might take him for uh, neurovascular emergencies like uh, he might think that there is uh, some midbrain posterior uh, uh, the, the third nerve uh, 
might be involved and there is a uh, aneurysm of the uh, posterior cerebellar artery and they might take him up for neurosurgical intervention so if the patient has card ad card in their pocket then they, those patients might be saved from these uh, unnecessary neurosurgical intervention thank, thank you sir. thank you so thank much you. one quick thing i would say this yeah we do all it but sometimes if you just look at the pupil, like before we start the swinging flashlight, just analyze your pupil individually. And you will understand that one pupil, if it's briskly reacting and the other is sluggishly reacting, we know that the reaction itself will tell us that this patient, and obviously looking at the other things, has issues related to like an optic nerve neuropathy. So look at the pupil individually before you just jump into a swinging flashlight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jyoti. Always a pleasure to listen to your pupil talk. Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Ramesh Kekunea. As Santosh mentioned, he's a director of Dark Ophthalmology and Neuroophthalmology at Anand Prasad Eye Institute. And he's going to talk about uh, ptosis, sudden onset ptosis, and nuclear plaque. Thank you, Rashmin. Uh, thanks a lot for having me today. Uh, yeah, just sharing the slide. Yeah, I'm going to talk about. Uh, Two issues, they are different, but uh, double vision and ptosis, it's a combination. Whenever we see these kind of uh, patients, how do we go about? So I have uh, uh, kind of uh, made this presentation into two parts. The first part is what do you ask for in the history when you look at a diplopia case? I'll cover that in the first five minutes. And then I will show five to six uh, uh, cases depending upon the uh, time, and then we can go forward. Uh, obviously, any questions, uh, suggestions uh, we can take. So, whenever you see a case of uh, double vision, just make sure that it's monocular or binocular. Just with the pinhole, you will know that. If it is a kind of uh, uh, binocular on occlusion, it will go, the, bar, the double vision will go. Second thing is always make sure whether it's physiological or not. Third thing is, and the most important thing is, if the movement is good or it's not good, even if there is a subtle movement uh, difference, that's important. And if there is a movement difference, is it worse in any kind of gaze direction? Whether in right, gaze or left gaze, up gaze or down gaze or uh, inferotemporally, wherever it is, how it is different, just find out. And then is there any, as the patient is walking in, is there any kind of abnormal head posture uh, which suggests horizontal, vertical or sometimes they can come with the head tilt. And the sixth thing, sometimes we try to Ask it at the last moment, but it's important. Does it vary during the day? This is important because some of the cases of myasthenia can masquerade anything what you are looking at. The, the seventh thing, trauma or surgery can tell you what has gone wrong with this, that particular patient rather than investigating too many things. For example, ptosis with pupil involvement, third nerve palsy, if there is a trauma, most likely, it's not an aneurysm. Still, you might get an imaging done because you want to see whether there is any kind of other uh, neurological deficit the patient has. Otherwise, we are not looking at aneurysm in these cases. And also, look around because whenever there is a diplopia, it can be at the muscle level. It can be at the nerve to muscle level. It can be at the Orbit level. Sometimes the muscle can be because of myasthenia. Sometimes muscle can be because of thyroid or myositis or cysticercosis. You know, it's not always uh, one thing. So, and also it can be something pressing in the orbit, causing either a proptosis or a signs of orbital mass. And very rarely it can be even because of enophthalmos, because in a fracture, you will see enophthalmos, not proptosis. And the ninth part, always we are dealing with eye and brain. We are also dealing, always think about brain. It's not only about eye. 
And the last part is just coming to some kind of uh, etiology. You need to ask for infections, metabolic disease. You know, even if you don't ask, you'll have to look for these things. You know, how the patient is walking. Okay, if there is too much of tremor, I'm thinking it could be progressive supranuclear palsy or, you know, the subtle double vision because of brain tumor, which is causing a sixth nerve or some kind of peculiar nystagmus causing, you know, some kind of cerebral light tumor. All these things are possible. And specifically, if at all there is one message from this talk, whenever there is a patient with double vision and lid drooping, you have to look at three or four things. Uh, uh, the mnemonic for that is LMP or LOP. LMP is lids, eye movements, and pupil proptosis or position. You know, eye position or pupil. You already heard a great talk from uh, Dr. Jyoti about pupil. But don't look at in isolation. See whether there is any proptosis or ocular position is different. Look at the pupil. Look at the eye movement. Look at the lids. These three things are closely related. And they are very closely related to the brain. And also, I will add one more mnemonic to this at the end of the talk uh, after showing a few of the cases. So case number one, fortunately or unfortunately, I can't make it interactive. I will only ask the question and I will only answer this. Typical patient coming to your OPD with the drooping of uh, lips and also on Elevating the lid, he has double vision. He doesn't know whether it is horizontal or vertical or sometimes torsional, all that. Additionally, he is a diabetic and he is hypertensive. No headache, no omitting, no scissors. As he is walking to the clinic, he looks okay. There are no other things. Orbit, position, everything looks okay. Pupils, most important, looks okay. There is no associated pain other than double vision. This is mostly a probable case of ischemic third nerve palsy. As you can see here, there is adduction limitation, there is elevation limitation, there is depression limitation in the left eye, but there is in the right eye, sorry, in, but there is no any kind of uh, pupil involvement. So in these kind of cases, you directly think it's uh, ischemic third nerve palsy. Monitor them, monitor them very closely. If you are not sure, call them after a few days. Ask them, do a teleconsultation with them. Do they develop any kind of other things? And if there are no neurological signs which you can see, probably we can watch that. This is one of the cases of diplopia with ptosis, probably due to an ischemic third nerve palsy. In retrospect, it's an ischemic third nerve palsy. Same thing, she is a bit older lady, 80 year old, with drooping of the left eye, sudden onset, and very typical feature of third nerve palsy with adduction limitation, elevation limitation, downward limitation. Intorsion is present on downward uh, movement. Here, you have to image because this patient has difference in the pupil size. Obviously, her vision is good, not really bad. There is no RAPD or anything on reverse RAPD test. There is an anisocoria. The involved eye is dilated. Here, immediately I am thinking there could be something because whenever there is no trauma, pupil involved, most likely it has to be aneurysm. Sure enough, there is a large aneurysm there. So both the presentations are similar. I'm just showing some additional history and some examination. That's why I said the first 10 points for double vision history and correlating with your lid motility and pupil. Most of the times you can come to a fairly pre-radiological or uh, pre-investigation diagnosis in most cases. One more case, this guy had a trauma. You can see 
there is a change in the lid uh, fissure. On abduction, there is narrowing. Heastosis, he also has adduction limitation and elevation limitation and all that. This is an aberrant innovation. Most of the times when you see aberrant innovation, there has to be some damage to the sheath. In this case, there is a trauma related third nerve palsy, which is partial now, partially resolved. This is a traumatic because here in that 10 history points, trauma was very, very important. He has a significant trauma. Pupil involved or not really doesn't match, matter much here when there is significant uh, trauma and he has aberrant innovation. This is typical. Third no palsy, traumatic with aberrant innovation presenting to you with double vision and ptosis of acute onset. Similar presentation, not really acute, acute, uh, uh, you know, Subacute presentation with the ptosis, with adduction limitation, with typical features. She also had aberrant innovation, by the way. Uh, this picture is not showing. I'm sorry, I could not show that picture. And she has absent lid crease there because probably it's a little bit uh, longer. She has this then since six months. Whenever there is an aberrant innovation, don't label it as congenital. What happens is even in congenital third nerve palsies, you have to do an imaging. What to look for? Course of the third nerve and also caliber of the third nerve. And also carefully, you can look at the course of the third nerve with the skull base uh, view by the radiologist. And you can also do a contrast, which you can see in this case. There is an enhancement across uh, the, the third nerve. It's that the cavernous uh, area, you can see an enhancement. Right and left, you compare. This is possibly one of the causes of aberrant innovation in children without trauma, or even in adults, it happens. But most of the childhood third nerve palsies, if you see an aberrant innovation with the pupil involvement or without pupil involvement, most likely, it's a schwannoma. Again, this child was third now with the presentation of double vision and ptosis, but it was not really acute. It's a subacute. I am showing here because sometimes they will say that it's there since uh, six weeks or six months or three months. You might think that, okay, she's neurologically okay. There is nothing. But in these cases, Special radiological test really helps. The schwannoma along the course of third nerve is important. This is something, ptosis, double vision, not very typical of third nerve palsy. You can see she has a small exotropia with hypertropia and sometimes it is hypo. You can see in this three picture, lid crease is present, again acute onset, Pupil not involved, not a very typical third nerve palsy. They can also come as third nerve. This is a typical case of myasthenia. Again, uh, not typical diurnal variation was there, but ruling out everything. She also had a positive ice pack test, positive fatigue test. All the lid signs which are suggestive of myasthenia was there. Most likely, it's a clinical diagnosis but most often it is missed. People think it's third nerve palsy or sixth nerve palsy with ptosis and they think it's an orbital lesion. All that happens. But this case was an ocular myasthenia. Uh, what do you do? Most of the times you can do pharmacological test. You can do some kind of antibody, immunological test you can do it or electrodiagnostic test. This patient had a uh, ptosis, moderate ptosis with elevation and adduction limitation, not again third nerve palsy kind of picture, but he had elevation in adduction was limited. You can see other movements are good. Even this movement is good. Abduction is good. Little bit of nystagmus is there. At that time, we used to have this stencil on. You can see once you give this uh, pharmacological test, the ptosis really improved. There are two things with regards to myasthenia. One is high index of suspicion. 
when something is not fitting into, uh, you know, whether it is muscular, multiple muscles involved, no cystocercosis, no orbital lesion, uh, probably no neurological, no pupil involved, you need to think about. Because again, I'm stressing the factor that whenever somebody comes with double vision with ptosis, it can be at the muscle level due to myasthenia, thyroid, cystocercosis, or myositis, or something pushing from the orbit, or it can be nerve to the, the muscles, it can be infranitia, it can be supranitia. So these are the four uh, things you should always remember. Uh, probably, uh, Rashmin, probably I will be, this is 14 minutes, probably the last case I'll be showing. If you have time, I'll show three more cases. Uh, this is a bilateral uh, uh, ptosis, again, acute onset. Pupil not involved. This particular case, pupil is not involved. Again, your index of suspicion is against towards uh, myasthenia. We did a pharmacological and pharmacological test, which was negative. Especially when you have bilateral external ophthalmophagia leading to double vision like this, this patient, again, pupil is normal. You have to think something very unusual. Sure enough, she had something very unusual, the cysticercosis at the brainstem. That was causing a supranuclear bilateral palsy in her case. Most of these cases, pupil will be involved. Uh, very rarely, pupil can be spared. So we had to give uh, treatment for her. And the uh, following treatment, it improved just with the cysticercosis uh, treatment. She improved uh, in this particular case. Uh, Rashmin, if I can show two or three cases, I will show. Otherwise, I'll stop here. No, please go ahead, Ramesh. Okay. Okay. Uh, again, I will uh, proptosis, ptosis with double vision in this child. He was not really very well uh, systemically. Uh, he had proptosis also. Initially, it was thought to be orbital cellulitis because, again, orbital cellulitis or preceptal cellulitis also can come with these kind of suspicion that it's a third nopalcy because. Here, the space is pushing it. That's why muscle is not moving. But what is the clue in his case is tip of the nose. Can you see a, a boil there? That was a clue in this particular case. You can see in all of these cases. Then we asked for uh, uh, an MRI. You can see the cavernous sinus uh, lesion this patient had. And then he had to undergo some kind of treatment. Very similar. Acute onset, ptosis, typically looking like uh, some kind of third nerve palsy. Vision was okay. No diabetes. Pupil was not involved in this case because there were no risk factors. We had to image. Again, she had this uh, uh, cavernous sinus lesion. Some of the typical cases you will see. I said lids, ocular motility, pupil and also the history, but always look at the face. Here, that pneumonic may not cover it, but when you see a shingle like this, it's a herpes zoster related third palsy. So with the medication, with the eye drop, with the tablets, it recovers over a period of time. You can see both cornea as well as the third palsy improved. History of trauma, so much chemosis, something is pushing, from the orbit or somewhere behind. When you see so much, always think about a uh, keratidocavernous fistula. You can see a very dilated superior ophthalmic vein here. So again, correlate everything. He also had diplopia, but there are other clues for your diagnosis. So just three more cases, uh, uh, Rashmin, and then I will stop. Hypotropia, very large hypotropia with ptosis, intermittently double vision. But he's a child, he's not very sure about it. I'll show very similar three cases. Hypotropia with elevation deficit and also abduction. This child is 15-year-old. He says acute onset, 
double vision. This gentleman is 75 year old, same kind of uh, double vision, hypotropic eye, little bit ptosis on looking down. All three of them, the presentation is more or less similar. This patient has since birth. This patient has since 15 days. This patient has since uh, two months or so. Limitation of abduction, elevation is the predominant eye movement. Pupil is not involved. All three cases are different etiology. This patient had a dysplastic inferior rectus. You can see mostly it is congenital. Why am I showing is still the causes can be different. This is the inferior rectus, cysticercosis, that are, can also cause a little bit of abduction limitation because of the inferior rectus involved. And this is the thyroid of the mobile. Again, why am I showing this? History that 10 points, thyroid, you know, infection, duration, variability, again, add lit pupil motility. So these are the cases I just wanted to present. I will present the last slide of summary. I would add one more thing to it, that is limp. Limp is add imaging. Along with that 10 history points, if you do LMP or LOP, along with imaging, clinical evaluation or overview of ptosis with double vision becomes very easy for all of us. Thank you so much uh, for the kind attention. I'm happy to take if there are any questions and I invite uh, uh, comments from the panelists. Thank you, Dr. Kutenya. It was a wonderful talk with really some good pearls there to look for, right? Uh, I just want to add that it's very important to differentiate between monocular and binocular diplopia, as you rightly said in the very beginning, once whenever the patient walks in OPT. That's the first step because there are multiple causes of monocular diplopias as, as well. And sometimes it happens that, you know, patient may confuse metamorphopsia with diplopia. So that's also quite common. And it's, then you have to look at fundus also for any macular lesion, particularly macular edema or CME in such cases. The other point which I thought when you have multiple cranial nerve palsies, as you rightly said, the important differential in such cases is myasthenia because no nothing else may be able to explain this kind of lesion. So checking corneal sensation at that point of time will give you a clear-cut idea because sensory nerves do not get involved in myasthenia. So it's important to do a corneal sensation at that point of time whenever you are in doubt. So uh, I, if anyone else wants to add anything, sir, go ahead, sir, Dr. Gandhi, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ramesh. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, let's move on since we are already at 8.30. We have uh, Dr. Digvijay now uh, who's going to talk on discipline. Thank you, uh, AIOS, Dr. Santosh, Dr. Ashmin, for having me here. I'm going to now uh, talk about uh, disc edema. So, if my, are my slides visible? Yes. Okay, let me put it into slideshow mode. Just a sec. Uh, it's, okay, has, yeah, I think it is in slideshow mode now. So we're going to now talk about an approach to a patient with swollen discs, as well as I'll show about, I think, seven, eight cases of different forms of swollen discs and, you know, what's important right up front as we are discussing triage as well in the uh, current uh, session. So, of course, we've already gone through this along with all the lot of speakers. In terms of history, you want to look at diminution of vision. And this is very important. Is the, If you are getting a disc edema, is there reduced vision or is there normal vision? So that's very, very important. Associations with it, is there any double vision? Is there any association, any restriction of movement that you can see, any headaches that the patient is having? Is it transient obscurations of vision? So a lot of these associations, other neurological deficits is another thing that you need to look at in terms of the history, as well as your general systemic examination. For the ocular examination, what's very, very important is the ocular movements. And so is there any kind of a dysmotility? Is there any restriction in movement? Uh, along with that, look at the pupils. Is there an afferent pupillary defect, a relative afferent pupillary defect or not? Uh, you can do a quick color vision. Again, that is something that is going to help us in telling how, 
how much is the vision actually affected and and we know that the color vision does get affected in uh, some of these causes that we'll come to up front contrast sensitivity and a quick confrontation visual field very important to do a visual field in these cases and you can do one in your clinic right up front before you go for a formal investigation in the form of visual fields or the oct uh, that we can go and we'll see cases of that as we come along so causes for disc edema essentially you can divide disc edema into unilateral and bilateral disc edema and within unilateral it could be hyperemic or pallid so if you're getting a unilateral disc edema which is hyperemic you're thinking first in terms of papillitis or optic neuritis of course it could be pseudopapilledema as, hy as hypermetropic discs also appear hyperemic and i'll show you a picture of that to go ahead could be compressive and other disc pathologies and we'll come to each of these cases as we proceed uh, in terms of pallid it's Primarily ischemic neuropathies, and that also the arthritic ischemic form of optic neuropathies that cause a pallid disc edema or a long standing disc edema pallor could develop. Bilateral disc edema, we're thinking in terms of papilledema, which is raised, uh, which is a disc edema in the presence of raised intracranial pressure, which could happen because of intracranial space occupying lesions, or it could be idiopathic intracranial hypertension. You could have uh, compressive neuropathies as well. You could have bilateral uh, optic neuritis, so bilateral papillitis. And so some of these are the common causes for disc edema. This list is not uh, complete or comprehensive, but this list is essentially the common ones that you'll come across and the ones that we'll be discussing herein. You know, hypertensive uh, retinopathy, papillopathy, diabetic papillopathy can also cause bilateral disc edema or unilateral disc edema as well. Neuroretinitis also comes under the unilateral hyperemic category out here. So this is what the disc could look like. It could either look like a hyperemic disc, as you see in the first image on the left, with the blurred disc margins, uh, a swollen disc, but not overtly swollen. This is what typical papillitis would look like to you. And this happens in cases of optic neuritis, neuroretinitis. The second one, the middle image is showing a sectoral kind of a disc edema with some pallor that is developing. And this is what we see in ischemic neuropathies. And on the right side, we're getting a very swollen disc, peripapillary hemorrhages, tortuous vessels. The cup is completely obscured, angry looking disc. This is what we see in severe cases of papillary edema uh, or idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And the investigations, as I said, are perimetry and visual fields could show all sorts of defects from constricted defects, altitudinal defects, central scotomas, and we'll see some of those cases as we go along. Uh, the OCT, we look at the peripapillary edema that you see around the optic disc. You can look at the optic disc itself, and this also helps in differentiating disc drusen sometimes. And you've got the visual evoked potentials, which support the visual dysfunction that we are suspecting, and neuroimaging, in which the CT and the MRI and the ultrasound play a very, very important role. Pseudopapilledema is also important to differentiate from disc edema before we move ahead. In this case, you're getting disc margins, which, are, which may appear slightly blurred, typically seen in hypermetropic discs, small cup, obscured looking club. But the important thing to remember is that there's not too many vascular changes around the disc. The peri-disc area is not edematous. You won't see hemorrhages in that area. And in some cases of optic disc drusen, which is also comes under the pseudopapilledema category, you have scalloped margins or blurred or irregular margins that you may see. You may see ele elevation, knobbly, knobbly kind of discs looking, and we'll come to a case of that as well as we go ahead. So important to differentiate pseudopapilledema from true papilledema. Now let's look at cases. The first is a case of a young female, about 32-year-old female, who's had a sudden onset loss of vision. So again, as we discussed in history, loss of vision is important. And also, how did it happened it happened suddenly acute subacute chronic and that makes a difference to our diagnosis as we'll see in the algorithm that comes at the end uh, here you can see that the one of the eyes the right eye has a very good vision of six by six the left eye has a vision of six by 24 there was an rapd that was visible when you looked at the funders you can see that the disc margins are slightly blurred so how do you make a diagnosis in this how do you proceed so we as far as the history is concerned, sudden onset is important, young female is important, unilateral is important, present on examination, RAPD is important, color vision impairment is important, a vision which is in the range of 624 is also an important clue, though the vision in cases of papillitis, as we're seeing here, could vary from no PL all the way to near normal or 66 or 69 vision as well. Looking at all these clinical features, we create a diagnosis of papillitis or optic neuritis. And do we need to confirm it through investigations? We can do investigations in the form of, a, of an MRI to look for demyelination, but the diagnosis is most often clinical and that is enough for you to start treatment if you need to uh, in these cases. Treatment is in the form of giving IV methylprednisolone or steroids if the vision is low, but before that you need to investigate and rule out uh, you know, any contraindications to giving steroids. 
most of the times when the history is as typical as it is here, you can do away without, without doing any further investigations, but it does help in cases where you're suspecting multiple sclerosis or you're suspecting atypical optic neuritis, which doesn't form in, fall in this typical category as ONTT has described of an acute subacute vision loss uh, with, in a young female patient in one eye with a typical papillitis picture that we see here. Now, and I'll, let's go to another case now. In this case, we are seeing a older male patient who's having a, a pale, swollen kind of looking disc. The disc margins are obscured. This is actually a secondary optic atrophy that has developed. And this has been discussed, I think, by Dr. Rambika in the past as well. Vision in the left eye is very poor. Right eye seems to be seems normal. And other visual functions, the right eye are completely normal. So this is an evidence that there was some disc edema or some swelling in the disc earlier, which has led to this kind of a dirty looking atrophy, as you see the margins being blurred and a grayish looking disc with slight elevation. This, in this case, we need to understand that while the differential diagnosis could be any cause of unilateral disc edema with from optic neuritis to inflammatory that could have gone into an atrophy over time or compressive neuropathy, but this is a case where you do want to investigate further. And in this case, a neuroimaging showed that there was a sphenoid meningioma, which was probably compressing that nerve, leading to an optic atrophy picture over time, but initially there would have been a disc edema as well. Now let's look at another young uh, female here who's having bilateral edematous discs, as you can see in the pictures there. And this is a subacute onset since about two weeks. Uh, the vision is 618 in one eye, finger counting in the uh, or hand movements in the other eye. You can see that there is a constricted kind of a uh, field defect in one of the eyes and a more severe field defect in the other eye. There is a delayed uh, a VEP, the P100 latency is delayed. And on the OCT RNFL, you can see severe edema in the peripapillary uh, regions and there, but there is a subacute onset. So one has to remember that this could be, uh, this requires further investigation. And this could be, uh, because the color vision was also severely impaired, you could be looking at a case of bilateral optic neuritis. You could also be looking at a case of a, a papal edema, which has been long standing. But since the vision has only got affected now, maybe the patient realized later on. Uh, when we did a neuroimaging, we could see that there was enhancement along the optic nerves along both the optic nerves right up to the chiasma, there, there, was, a, uh, there was a demyelination in the spinal cord as well. This is typically uh, not seen in typical optic neuritis. So this does come under now the category of atypical optic neuritis, either neuromyelitis optica or MOG related optic neuritis. Further investigations were done as lumbar puncture or cerebrospinal fluid tap was done. The lumbar puncture essentially was all right, but we did get a serum positive uh, on MOG antibodies. So this is a case of a MOG optic neuritis. So remember, optic neuritis could have severe disc edema as well, even though most of the cases you will see papillitis, and it could be bilateral involving, as you've seen in this case, the patient was uh, you know, further treated with uh, IV steroids, IV immunoglobulins, put on rituximab. So some, a MOG requires a much longer treatment. It's not your typical optic neuritis. You can't get away with just a, uh, you know, a five doses of IV methylprednisolone and a short course of steroid. So it's also important, therefore, to differentiate the optic neuritis papillitis that we saw in the typical case versus something like this, which is much more severe from the edema front. Now let's look at a further more severe disc edema that is happening in again a young female who's overweight, who's presented with a subacute vision loss, who's presented with headaches, uh, transient ischemic, uh, uh, transient uh, vision loss earlier on, and you can see uh, the vision itself is is well preserved. She's seeing six by six in both the eyes, and here of course the first step we have to do is to rule out any intracranial space occupying lesion because this is a papillary edema. So an MRI was done, and the MRI was completely normal. So what does that leave us with in terms of diagnosis? A, a very high chance of idiopathic intracranial hypertension, uh, considering the risk factors here, which is a female overweight in the in the you know uh, early adulthood uh, to and uh, the lumbar puncture is indicated to look for the opening pressure and treatment has to be planned so investigations wise of course an mri and a lumbar puncture is what you're looking at and treatment in this case usually consists of medical treatment of reducing the pressure with certain medicals like medicines like acetazolamide or manadol in the acute phase and surgical treatment in the form of uh, shunt, shunts or uh, optic nerve sheet fenestration can also be considered now let's look at another case here, which is again a very severe disc edema. You can see uh, 
there are a lot of uh, hemorrhages around the disc. This is a male patient. And what I want to show here is that look at how quickly the visual field got lost from the very first field that he had. And by the time he underwent his MRI and other investigations, it was an acute loss of vision. And therefore, these patients or these cases should not be treated uh, as benign, as earlier the, use, the word used to be benign intracranial hypertension. And that changed because you can see how much the vision loss has happened in such a short period of time. These, these are hardly about a week apart these images that were taken. Of course, there, were, there was a very high uh, opening pressure on lumbar puncture, and the MRI in this case showed that there was a cerebral venous thrombosis. As you can see, this cord-like cerebral venous, the venous thrombosis, uh, you know, in the back, sagittal thrombus, and you can see some contrast enhancement also. So again, these cases where there is the venous sinus thrombosis will have a sudden severe spike in intracranial pressure that's going to lead to bilateral fulminant papilledema, which is going to lead to vision loss very fast. And this requires intervention very soon with uh, uh, intervention from both the ophthalmology side as well as the neurologist side to take care of this thrombus. And the neuro intervention. Let's come to another case. Now we're moving to an older person who's had a vision loss in one of the eyes. You can see here in the, uh, the vision loss in the right eye that has happened, subacute. Typically, he complained of it as happening when he woke up in the morning, on awakening in the morning, there was some, some slight amount of headache, but he's had some transient episodes of vision obscuration in the past as well. You can see the right eye vision is very low. The left eye vision is also slightly low, but you can see on the, fun, uh, on the fundus photograph that there is a sectoral edema in the upper part of the optic disc. It's not appearing very pale here, but the, the, you can see that there is an edema in one area of the disc. Uh, the OCT has picked it up very beautifully and look at the visual field below on the left. You can see that there is an inferior altitudinal defect. So the bottom part of the field has been lost. The left eye visual field seems okay. The left disc also here you can see is a, almost a cupless disc, a 0.1.2 cupping. So this is a disc at risk. This is a case of non-arthritic ischemic optic neuropathy, which is typically seen in the elderly with, with systemic risk factors such as hypertension, diabetes like this patient had or, or a collagen vascular disorder. And these cases need to be uh, managed in terms of managing the risk factors. There is no definitive treatment for the NAI1 cases alone, but a test that is very, very important here right at the offset when you're suspecting is the ESR and CRB. And I'll come to the next case to show you why those test, two tests are important, why you need to try this patient for an early evaluation. After you've looked at it, control of the systemic risk factors, you can give ecosprin. There is some evidence of use of oral steroids, but it is, uh, it's not definitive. So there is really no other confirmed treatment, but this is a case you should be able to diagnose as well. And you'll again see an RAPD uh, in this case. This is another patient of an elderly gentleman who's had a vision loss in, and I'll come to this one first, who's had a vision loss. Uh, so uh, the previous case, you saw that the vision over time did show some recovery on its own, but not too much change. And there is some element of natural recovery that happens and the other eye remained as such. And we did put the patient on some eco screen as well to prevent this from happening to the other eye and the systemic risk factors were controlled. An elderly gentleman who's had history of headache, some history of scalp tenderness, jaw claudication, Vision loss in one eye suddenly, as well as in the other eye, bilaterally, almost simultaneously, a few days, a few hours apart, very high ESR and CRP. And see, this is important because this is showing this is an inflammatory response that is being that is being seen here, and there is no diabetes, no hypertension, uh, and look at what the discs look like. Right in the beginning, the patient presents, there is a bilateral disc edema, there is a pallor in the disc, and see what happens over just a few days. The disc is going into severe pallor in both the eyes. So this is a case of an arthritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. So of course, this patient didn't have a temporal artery biopsy, but that is an investigation that you could do, an investigation of choice. Perimetry in the eye that we could do, which is having slightly better vision, again, is showing an altitudinal field effect. The other eye had almost a snap out of vision. Uh, this requires high dose steroids for a long period of time, unlike what is there in the non arthritic ischemic neuropathy. Arthritic ischemic neuropathy is emergency treatment, urgent treatment for a long period of time. And you can look at the ESN or CRP over time till that settles. You have to continue to treat the patient with steroids. So, again, one of those cases where you don't want to miss it uh, at all. This is a patient who's having a young child who's had a disc edema looking in disc, scalloped margins, slightly bumpy, lumpy looking disc. Uh, was suspected of disc edema, but the fields were quite normal. Uh, the OCT was showing some, uh, I think one of the cuts here is a little small, but it is showing, they were showing some lumps and uh, some uh, hyper intensities, hypo intensities in the OCT. The ultrasound has shown a, a spike, calcific spike right here. And you can see a couple of those 
spikes as well in the uh, on the sides. So this is a case of an optic disc glucin. Looks like a disc edema, but this is kind of like a false disc edema. Over time, though, it's while it does may not cause any vision loss at all, it can cause an enlargement of the blind spot. So the algorithm that you have to follow: number one, is the disc edema true or false whenever you see a disc? Two, is it unilateral, bilateral? So start putting it in these buckets and you'll start to reach your diagnosis. And then, of course, further management, which is uh, there is uh, beyond the scope of this per current webinar. And is it hyperemic or palates? So if you put your, uh, if you think of it in this logical way, you can in most of the cases or the classic cases reach a diagnosis. There, of course, will be a few which, which don't strictly fit in any one of these buckets, but then there always are exceptions. But as a whole, uh, an approach to a disc edema is fairly logical and algorithmic, and this is something that you can do. So in terms of the take-home messages, if always approach each patient in a systemic manner, as I've described here, do the history, the examination, the investigations, suspect the typical, but always also look for the atypical in these cases, because a disc edema could be because of various reasons, as we've seen here, and try to put them in one of the buckets and manage your treatment therein. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Dick, Dr. Digby Singh, for that extensive overview of disc edema. Uh, you have rightly pointed out that uh, uh, we need to differentiate it into the buckets of uh, unilateral or bilateral with defective vision or without defective vision and the associated uh, uh, findings together with the other relevant investigations. Uh, so you also pointed out the uh, importance of identifying uh, uh, innocuous disc edema, such as the pseudo disc edema, drusens, and uh, the more dangerous looking uh, papilledemas with the uh, vision loss, uh, rightly pointed out that it's no longer called a benign ICT because of the potential to cause total vision loss, and instead it's being called as idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So, thanks for extensively covering all these topics. I just have one question for you. Is it possible to have a coexistent true disc edema along with the uh, drusen? And if so, how do we differentiate the two? Yes, that is in fact a, a good question. And I have uh, I have come across uh, a case like that who was uh, you know who was being treated. See, uh, so uh, of course uh, there are in drusens also there are now drusens who are which are buried. And the drusens which are visible. So, of course, if it is if it's a visible kind of a drusen, you can differentiate between the two. But you will not get that peripapillary edema that you will catch if you're doing an, an OCT uh, around the drusen the way it is in a true disc edema. That's one. Uh, number two, the, uh, the the basic clinical presentation that you'll see in terms of the vision changes that you might see would be also be different. A drusen would be very innocuous uh, being lying there. But that said, uh, it's a it's a rare rare of rare situation that you're uh, talking about right now and the pup uh, of course the pupils can help if it's unilateral yes and uh, can there be some uh, field loss in uh, optic risk drusens uh, some vision loss in the course of time yes so even optic risk drusens while we do say they're innocuous they're benign they're probably not doing anything they can lead to vision uh, to field loss from uh, field loss from uh, just enlarged blind spot to even uh, altitudinal losses and other losses that can happen because they can cause compromise the disc and the, and the nerve fiber and the vascularity in that area. But mostly an enlarged blind spot is what you'll typically see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mahesh. And uh, we come to the last talk uh, of uh, this webinar. Yeah. And it's a pleasure to invite Dr. Naveen Jai Kumar, who was introduced by Dr. Sintosh. Additional uh, introduction of Dr. Naveen Kumar that he is also the current president of Indian Neurophthalmology Society. He is going to talk about uh, visual fields. Dr. Naveen. Dr. Naveen, uh, you are muted, sir. Got it. Yep. Can you hear me now? Is it okay? All good, sir. Uh, good. Thank you, Rashmi. So today, my focus is going to be a little bit on the art of pattern recognition, which is extremely important as far as the neuro-ophthalmology visual fields are concerned. Um, so here goes. Yeah. So for the, uh, for the purposes of looking at visual fields throughout the visual pathway, uh, I generally tend to divide the visual fields into four regions. The first one is the outer retina, which is basically the rods and cones and the bipolar cells. And 
the most typical way the field would present it, you get all sorts of patterns, but they would correspond to a visual fundus lesion. For example, in here, you have a chorioretinal scar, which is below the disc and the macula. And here you have a corresponding field defect, which is superior between the disc and the fixation. So this field defects corresponds perfectly well with this particular lesion. Moving on, as far as the inner retina is concerned, which is essentially the retinal ganglion cells and the RNFL and the optic nerve itself, the hallmark is, of course, the classic central and the centrosecal scotomas that you see here. But you can also get the altitudinal defects and all the glaucomatous defects would fall uh, into, into this pattern. The third region is, of course, the optic chiasm. And the classic, of course, is what you see here, which is the bitemporal hemianopia. You can get smaller scotomatous versions of this as heavy scotomas and occasionally binasal defects as well. And finally, this entire region behind the optic chiasm, which com comprises the optic tract, the lateral geniculate body, optic radiations, and visual cortex. So this entire retrochiasmal pathway will produce a contralateral homonymous immunopia of various shapes, but it will always be contralateral and it will always be homonymous. So let's move on uh, to a couple of cases, uh, quick uh, examples. So this is a patient, uh, this used to be interactive, but I'll answer it myself for now. Uh, so this is a patient who complained of a sudden visual uh, difficulty in, on, in his left eye uh, of sudden onset. And this is the field defect in the left eye. So you might think that this is region one, something inside the eye or the optic nerve, etc. But I would direct your attention to something that has not been shown right now, which is the field of the right eye. The moment I show the field of the right eye, I think your brain would kick in now with a pattern recognition and say, oh, these two fields are looking almost the same. In fact, if you see this stepwise defect here, it almost matches the one on the other field as well. So this kind of lesion is called a cookie cutter lesion because of the scalloped shape of it. And this is very, very typical of occipital cortical infarcts. So that was an example of a homonymous hemianopia, which is incomplete. And because it is incomplete, you are able to make an assessment about the shape and the extent and the similarities between both sides. The symmetry between the defect on the right field and the left field points out in this case uh, to the occipital cortex clearly. So my first lesson is, of course, always perform visual fields in both eyes, irrespective of which eye has the vision problem. So here is another example. Uh, this is a patient with bitemporal hemianopia. Or is it? Because we might be looking at it a little differently. So let me change your perspective to this. And you, what you can see now is if you have your right feed in front of your right eye and the left feed in front of your left eye, you can see this is not a bitemporal hemianopia, but a binasal hemianopia. It still is in the optic chiasm, but it's important to place the fields correctly as if you are the patient. So right field in front of your right eye, left field in front of your left eye. This is uh, the first of my slightly longer patient cases. This is a 41-year-old female whom I saw in 2013, uh, sorry, in 2014. But a year before, she'd had an MRI done with a pituitary adenoma, not compressing the optic chiasm, and it was secreting prolactin. So I had been seeing her for the past three years, 2014, 17, and 18. All these three occasions of visual acuity was normal and normal optic nerve function. And as you can see in the visual fields also are demonstrated on the right side of the screen. But then I lost follow up um, and she returned uh, in March this year. This time her visual acuity was still six by six, but there was a little bit of a temporal disc pallor in both eyes, but the color vision was still fine. Okay. So let me show you the field defect of 2023. So this is what you see now. You see a clearly a temporal defect in the left field extending from the blind spot, but also respecting the vertical meridian. Now, this is highly suspicious because something is obviously progressing. So we did an MRI and you can very clearly see this large pituitary adenoma with supracellar extension pushing the chiasm up. 
in the sagittal and the axial sections. But what's interesting is the coronal section that we see here in large. So what you see here, this is the tumor. It's very asymmetric in its growth. And what you see on top here, that is the optic chiasm, which has slid down to one side. And because it's slid down to one side, there is a compression by the tumor of the right optic nerve chiasm junction. And what do you get at the right optic nerve chiasm junction? You get the inferior peripheral fibers of the left optic nerve, which forms the anterior knee of Wilbrand on its way to the optic tract that side. So because of that, you get what is very classically a traquez junctional scotoma, which you can see here. Now I'm going to go back to the 2018 field that I thought looked fine in 2018. But now on hindsight, if I put it in next to the one in 2023, you can see that very slight superior temporal defects starting from the periphery and moving now by 2023 into the center. So this is the classic request junctional scotoma where one eye is absolutely normal field and the opposite eye, the apparently normal eye has a superior temporal peripheral defect. So in a unilateral optic neuropathy, here's lesson number three, the neurologically more important field is the field of the contralateral eye and of course, central 30 degrees will show you all, almost all the neurological field defects across the entire visual pathway, except probably you might sometimes miss these junctional scotomas because they start in the periphery. Okay. Uh, this is a small uh, uh, paper, but very interesting uh, about the relationship of visual fields and OCT RNFL to predict uh, potential visual acuity after surgery for chiasm and lesions. Essentially, this is what it is. Uh, field defects produced by, say, chiasm and lesions are due to two reasons. One is dead retinal ganglion cells, obviously, but also dysfunctional retinal ganglion cells, those which are partly affected. Whereas RNFL loss is entirely caused by dead retinal ganglion cells. So the difference that you see here is the dysfunctional cells. These might improve. So what, it, what this paper says is if you find visual field defects, but not much of RNFL loss, then it's possible that there are not, not, not so much of dead retinal ganglion cells, more dysfunctional ones which are contributing to the field defect and therefore visual recovery might be possible. So that's important here. What the message is, is when you have these patients, it's worthwhile doing an OCT RNFL also. It will have some prognostic effect on how the patient might improve following treatment. Now, this is my other patient, which I saw in Calcutta. Uh, he was a 49-year-old male, typhoid fever in February 2009. And then he had vertigo, and decreased vision on the left side. Visual acuity was 6'6", six, six, and the rest of the examination was absolutely normal. Let me show you a blow up of the left field. It's very bizarre. Okay. It looks like there's a superior altitudinal and looks like uh, bits of it inferiorly also involved. The only area which seems to be okay is this kind of a keyhole shaped area in the inferior field. Okay. So this looks like some, some fancy hairstyle. Uh, but let me show you. So you might be wondering where this kind of lesion is. But once again, as I said in the beginning, do the field of the other eye. We need both fields. So here is the field of the right eye. And once again, like in my very first field, what strikes you is the utmost similarity. It's almost like a carbon copy of the left and right field. It's almost as if I Xerox the whole thing and put it and said right. Okay. When you see defects like this, absolutely symmetrical, there can be no other place in the visual system except one. Okay, So let's take a look at this defect. You can see the absolute symmetry here, which is actually a right, incomplete, absolutely congruous homonymous hemianopia. And on the other side, you can again see an absolutely congruous, incomplete left homonymous seminopia as well. So what you saw in this very peculiar field was actually a bilateral, incomplete, extremely congruous homonymous seminopia, 
This was due to the bilateral PCA infarcts, each side contributing a contralateral incomplete defect as well. What about his vertigo? And here is the answer on the MRI. You can see the cerebellar uh, infarct uh, as well, producing the vertigo. So nice correlation between the visual fields and the symptoms with the MRI findings. So my last le second last lesson is called incomplete homonymous hemianopias. You can localize them to different regions, like uh, optic tract would give you in, uh, incongruous defects. LGBs can produce sector anopias. The radiations produce quadrantic defects, and the exquisitely congruous defects come from the occipital cortex. My last and most important lesson, I think, is doing confrontation fees in your clinic in the OPD. And it's particularly so in patients of poor visual acuity where formal field testing like your Humphrey field cannot be done. You really have to rely on your hands and your fingers. Secondly, doing a color target confrontation is as significant as actually picking up a defect on the formal field itself. And lastly, in right parietal lobe lesions with left homonymous hemianopias, the only way in which you can pick up hemi neglect is by doing a confrontation field. I would like to uh, quickly end on this uh, algorithm. So when we have a field defect, uh, compare is it unilateral or bilateral? If it's unilateral, it's belonging to the retina or optic nerve. If it's bilateral, the question you should ask yourself is, is it respecting the vertical meridian? If it isn't, it's usually the retina or the optic nerve once again. But if it is respecting the vertical meridian, we are dealing with a hemianopia of two varieties. One is it can be homonymous or it can be heteronymous, which comes in two flavors, the bitemporal and the binasal. And bitemporal, of course, you know, is the chiasm. Binasal, you can also get optic nerve diseases and retinal diseases, which can produce binasal kind of defects as well. As far as homonymous is concerned, look to see whether it's complete or incomplete. If it is complete, all you can say is it's a retrochiasmal lesion on the opposite side. Nothing more than that. But if it's incomplete and if it's incongruous, you can think of tract and LGB, sector defects, LGB, and very congruous defects in radiations and the cortex. I would like to deal, end with the, uh, one last thing here. Uh, since I spoke about pattern recognition, there's a lot of talk about artificial intelligence being used to kind of pick up visual field defects and, and use it to kind of make diagnosis as well. So I'm going to put a, uh, a paper which I asked as a quiz question recently in a quiz. And this is from skin cancers. And this is the investigative dermatology article in 2018 to highlight the need to train AI diagnostic algorithms for skin cancer. So what they did was they found in their study that the AI algorithm had learned that the presence of an inanimate object, an inanimate object in the photograph of a skin lesion indicated a malignancy. So my question was, what is this inanimate object which might be found in a school student's geometry box? And why did the AI decide that it is malignant? Anyone in the faculty? <laughs> Think of a school student's geometry box, there's something in it, and the AI decided that if this is present in a, a photograph, a skin lesion is most likely malignant. Hmm. Can't think of. Uh... Okay, it's something you'd have seen in all HPEs. It's the ruler. <laughs> okay, so this thing was trained on thousands of photographs. And most of the malignant skin lesions had a ruler next to it, obviously, for taking pictures to determine growth in size. So as I said, there, in our data set, images with rulers, the AI decided are more likely to be malignant. So the algorithm inadvertently learned that rulers are malignant. Okay, <laughs> So it's important right now, we are going to end up with AI, maybe 10 years maybe later, we'll be having a field talk on how AI is being used to determine this mark my words. But until then, until such a time for today, please use the net inside your brain and not the internet outside. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Navin. Uh,
May I request Virinder to start the discussion? Yeah. Uh, wonderful talk, Dr. Jackman. I think you covered very well with the algorithm also that how to utilize the template. I would think what we all have to understand in that in neuroophthalmology, the biggest role of visual fields is to help localize the lesion. And we, instead of like in glaucoma, we analyze the field one eye at a time. Here we need to put the fields of both eyes together and put it as the patient sees. Like you told in the slide that right field on the right side and right eye field on the right side, left on the left side, and then apply the template. The another small important thing possibly I would like to add here is that even a slightest respect of vertical, even in one eye, might be very important because the other eye field might have been quite affected. So even in one eye, we are able to see many a times the grayscale might be showing it up still while the, other, the field effect is becoming quite dense, can be useful. And uh, one more thing possibly for the benefit of all uh, postgraduates and uh, audience is that we, we can get little more information. For example, if the bitemple hemianopia, we look at it, if it is worse superiorly, it will indicate the compression is arising from below. It's likely to be a pituitary macroadenoma. Whereas if the, the worse if field effect is worse inferiorly, then we might think that the compression is coming from the upper half. So it's more likely to be a supracellular tumor rather than an intracellular tumor growing up. These are some of the other important things that we can look at. And similarly, there is the role of visual fields in uh, monitoring the progression of the disease or recovery. So that also is an important thing. Serial visual fields in a patient with a known case of tumor could suggest that a recurrence is happening or it is becoming worse. And it could also help us prognosticate, as you said, that especially along with the role of the OCT, RNFL and MGCL OCT, it could help us prognosticate. So these were the small inputs apart from the wonderful talk you already gave. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sisdeva. Are there any last uh, comments? Uh, we already are almost at the end of the allotted time. Any comments? If there are no further comments, I would sincerely like to thank uh, all the speakers and panelists for such wonderful interactive session. And a special thanks to uh, AIOS for curating this uh, this session. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you.